How's it going ladies and bruises? I'm Bobby Six, kind of welcome back to Deluge. Uh, our window just got broken, so we should probably get a wriggle on before somebody murders us. Some priest murders us. Does that guarantee you an entrance into heaven? If a priest murders you? I feel like it should. Anyway. Suddenly we were shaken by the sound of breaking glass. A large stone had crashed through the window and come hurtling onto the floor. For a second, Ina sat frozen, still clutching the document tightly in her fist. But then she stood up from her chair. It's the church. They're onto us. Run. Good idea. Danger. Nice. Perfect. We always get perfect with uh, May. That's the main thing. She seems nice. Part 4. Crosswinds. I'm ready. Let's run from the church. We scrambled down the stairs and out through the fire escape. I hadn't fully recovered from our previous sprint and began to lag behind, but Ina grabbed me by the arm, pulling me onwards through the streets. We made it to Ina's house. As we entered her room, she locked the door and hastily closed the curtains. You think they'll find us here? Oh, they will, but I think they've stated their case. They're bound to leave us alone for now. I hope we don't end up like Karen. But Ina was already rifling through her papers, trying to find the passage where she'd left off. The next morning I spent indoors, resting my weary head. I'd abstained from putting my recent discoveries to paper, as I was aware the family would habitually go through my belongings whenever I was out. That's a cause for concern. When I returned to the beach later that afternoon, all traces of yesterday's vigil had been erased by the morning tide, and it wasn't long before I caught Hendrika sitting against a sand dune. She was quietly singing to herself an old fishwife's tune. Herring ashore, herring ashore, put on your boots, they'll be back with more. Herring ashore, herring ashore. She was no longer making any effort to conceal her perpetual surveillance of me. The following day I conversed with Kuiper. He appeared to have returned to his affable self without any trace of the possessed fervor I'd witnessed him, him two nights ago. I surmised to him that I'd not found anything abrasive within his teachings, that I would take the night's ship in order to relay the message to the presbytery. Kuiper seemed pleased and thanked me heartily for my visit. And to be honest, the man made such a wholesome impression on me that afternoon that I felt inclined when the evening silence fell upon the town once more to embark to the beach one last time, just to confirm that my conclusions were truly correct and as to not lay false judgment upon his character. That night as I headed through the dunes, I noticed that the air was devoid of smoke and when I arrived at the place where the sermon had previously been held, I found it to be desolate. The tide was fully out that night so the island was at its largest, and I could walk out far over the moonlit beach, and that's what I saw it, far in the distance, at the northernmost tip of the isle. There shone a faint light. And as I hurried toward the light under the cover of the dunes, as to not fall prey to watching eyes, I saw that a large gathering of people had converged once more, and that some of them carried torches, and Kuiper was speaking, leading the sinister ceremony in his animated manner. I took shelter behind a cluster of large stones that stood close to the dunes. But as the tide was out and the congregation stood near the shoreline, I could not clearly make out the reverend's words. However, the torches of moonlight illuminated the nocturnal scene, and I had a clear line of sight of the spectacle which took place upon the shore. For, for more than an hour, the reverend preached, and over time I grew aware of a certain visceral change in his gesticulations. It was as though the motions of his hands and his body became more erratic and disjointed in nature. And simultaneous with his change, his voice grew louder to the point which I could clearly make out the sounds he brought forth. But what, what reached my ears no longer resembled any human speech, for it had acquired a strange guttural quality that sounded wholly alien to me. In all his characteristics, Kuiper had become ailed with an unholy demonic possession that made me pray to any remaining forces of good on this forsaken isle. And after his sermon, the noise died down, and I could see a silhouette upon the shore, which I recognized as the silhouette of a young woman. And I could see that she was unclothed, her pale white skin reflecting the moonlight to the extent that it appeared to be glowing. And she had waved, waving black hair that reached down to her thighs, and from what I could tell it was Hendrika, the pastor's daughter. And as she stepped forward and knelt down into the surf with the eyes of the congregation upon her, I saw a ripple passing through the waters. And though it was completely windless night, the sea erupted in a sudden tempest. And in the pale light I fancied I saw a hundred thousand pitch black wires coiling through the waves. And then something emerged from the waters. I deemed it to be a shadow at first. It was blacker than the dead of night, but it rose higher. As it rose higher, I soon found it to be wholly opaque. A solid mass, 
pitch black as though no light could ever escape from it. And as it emerged, the crowd erupted in ecstasy, uttering words in heathen tongues and reciting the name Lotan. The being crept onto the sand and into the ring of bystanders, slowly it drew toward the black-haired girl. And I fear I have no other word for the wholly unspeakable act, but it knew Hendrika. It knew her there, before countless eyes upon that moonlit shore. But already I was running back through the dunes, down the entire stretch of fields that lay between me and the harbour. And I clambered up to my room, gathering my clothes and papers haphazardly before rushing toward the dock where the mail boat lay that would leave for the mainland that night. And I sat there until it departed, all the while quivering, thinking of these things that exist beneath the waves, of which no good Christian man has any understanding. Ina sat there reading the last pages in silence while she dragged her nails through the fabric of his skirt. It ends with a long technical appeal in which he recommends expulsion of the Church of Abbott with the highest prejudice. As you would. That was quite the story, Ina nodded. Suddenly she'd become languid, as though all the excitement of the past hours had instantly seeped out of her. I have a lot to process, her voice drawled. I'm sorry, I really need to go to sleep. We can discuss our findings tomorrow. If you want, you can take the couch. I shall. I paced through the desolate streets, an unsanitary sensation washing over me, as though everything had suddenly been tinted by the strange superstitions that the church document had laid bare. Whatever it was that Ina had read to me yesterday evening, it appeared like something from a horror novel, and the realisation that the inhabitants of this town, Leopold, John Kuiper, Ina herself, had placed so much weight on it, showed just how underdeveloped their minds must have become. I've been callous. I've treated these people as my peers, but I should be careful. Suddenly, a voice rang out behind me. Down in the dumps? I jumped. Rika, nice to see you. Looks like someone has a bad conscience. She smiled. Anyway, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm okay. I had a rough night. I hope Ina hasn't been keeping you from your studies. She looked at me with an all-knowing eyes, making me wonder how much exactly she'd learned about our brush-in with the clergy last night and the mystifying document we managed to capture. Say, I wanted to thank you again for letting me join you on your beach trip last Wednesday. I realised I didn't leave you much of a choice, but I wanted you to know that it meant a lot to me. I'm blessed to have you as my friend. Sometimes I'm afraid to let myself go, you see. I get caught up in my workout schedule and my church duties, but sometimes I forget to savour the moment, to make lasting memories, at the beach with my friends. Youth is far too short to waste. I'd like to make more memories with you, Abe. She spoke with such honest candour that I couldn't help but be touched by her words. But then... Before I go, I'm curious. Did you find it? What? That book you were looking for last Monday. My heart skipped a beat. I forgot to ask if you managed to find it in the end. Her eyes shot fire. I was unsure how to respond. It was clear that she knew more than she was letting on. The question was how much. I'm afraid I didn't find it. He didn't. Her face warped into a menacing grimace. Didn't you? Will you please drop the charade? Her soothing words, her voice, the mockery in her smile, her entire presence ignited an explosive rage in me that burst out all at once. Just shut up. I have nothing to say to you. Already regretting my sudden outburst, my anger was over the second it erupted. I didn't tell you to say that. I told you to say, drop the charade. Not yell at her. Jesus. Silenced, but further unfazed, Rika took a step backwards. Wow, Abe. Please control yourself. But you're right, I apologise. I feel as though this conversation is drawn to an end. I have to go now, to prepare for the afternoon service. See you some other time. But yeah, she should drop the charade. It's bullshit. Stop acting like you don't know what's going on. Pushing the mystifying encounter with Rika to the back of my mind, I set off homeward through the sunlit streets, which were alive with gentle chirping of birds, until I detected a suspicious movement in the bushes. Reflexively, I adopted a defensive position, throwing up my arms to shield my vital organs. And while I observed the figure that emerged from the shrubs, I readied myself to flee the scene as soon as the situation necessitated it. But the hound made an unusually calm impression. Entirely devoid of the aggressive behaviour I'd previously grown accustomed to, he stared at me with pleading eyes. Not intending to lower my guard, I slowly edged backwards. Good doggy. You just stay there, no need to get physical with me. But when Ferris saw me back away, he immediately leapt up at me, playfully sniffing my fingers before letting out a short, loud bark. I almost jumped out of my skin. 
Eagerly, he hopped down again, dashing back toward the bushes from whence he came. And upon closer inspection, I saw that they gave way to a forest trail. Furus let out another bark. You want me to follow you? Again, a bark. I must remain wary. He could be attempting to lead me to a secondary location, where no one will find my mutilated corpse. But Ferris was already off, running up the forest trail a few yards, before turning around and barking for me to follow him. And driven by macabre curiosity combined with a latent death wish, I followed the dog to see where it would lead me. Ferris led me along the old perimeter of the island past the dolmen May had shown me last week, and through the nearby woodland, until we reached a patch of forest where the trees were bare and the ground was strewn with rocks. In the centre stood a large headstone. Ferris. You brought him here so quickly. The voice belonged to May, who was standing among the trees, dressed in archaic-looking clothes. Ferris appeared excited, leaping up at me expectantly. Poor dog, he's all worked up. I told him it was an emergency, that if he'd fetch you, you'd surely give him a treat. You did bring him something, didn't you? Bring him something? He made an empty promise. Ferris whined in disappointment, and I saw some of his prior hostility return to his eyes. You could offer him a peppermint. My suggestion was met with an angry snarl. Please don't be sad, Ferris. He did great. I'll get you a marrowbone when we return to the farm. So what is the big emergency you called me for? She contemplated for a second. Oh yes, the emergency. It's a secret. She smiled at me self-consciously. Well, if it's a secret emergency, I don't see how I could be of any help. Wait, I can tell you the secret. Again, she pondered. This is the secret. My secret hideout. Nobody knows about the hidden clearance. I highly doubt that. It's true, you didn't know about it, did you? There's a lot of things I don't know about. She pouted. I didn't even want to show it to you at first, but I decided I had to repay you. Repay me for what? For taking me to the beach. I hadn't been down there since childhood. The church is really strict, you know. Even when Rika goes shopping trips in the city, she hardly ever lets me come. So it's true you never leave the island. Not an island, I thought I told you so. You're beginning to sound like Rika. But you're right. It was my first trip in years. Anyway, there are enough pretty spots nearby. What do you think of this place? The forest floor here is littered with rocks. Do you know why? I shook my head. Well, I know. She grinned triumphantly. The soil around this town is filled with all kinds of different stones, which have to be removed to turn it into suitable farmland. So for hundreds of years, farmers have dumped their unnecessary stones up here in the woods. It makes for a pretty sight, doesn't it? Like a castle hall. My castle hall. Bow to your queen, loyal subject. It was clear the excitement had risen to her head. You should know they crown me Queen of Abbotsford every spring. Do you like my royal attire? As long as you're in my halls, you have to do exactly as I say. That goes without question. She pointed at the large gravestone behind her. There, the tomb of my forefathers. Their names are etched into the stone. Please tell me who, li who lies buried there. Let me take a careful look. I crouched down to inspect the faded epitaph. Hmm... It says that this is a memorial to St. Winifrith, the missionary who Christianized the Low Countries. In the year 750 AD, Winifrith was murdered by Germanic tribes at this site. That's all it says. Thank you, I've always thought as much, but I wanted to be certain. Poor Winifrith, the tribes mustn't have liked his teachings at the time. I guess in the end he did get his way. I glanced around the clearance. The trees here were without leaves as though they died a long time ago, their austerity adding to the consecrated atmosphere of the place. And while I strained my eyes to make out my surroundings, I grew aware of a steady fatigue that had been creeping up on me unnoticedly. The trees melted together in swaths of brown and grey, and after I caught my balance, I turned to May. I've had an eventful weekend. I'd like to go home now to get some rest before school starts. You're leaving already? Come, Abe, please stay for a little longer. I command you as your queen. I'm sorry. She squinted at me tellingly. But Abe, if you leave now, you won't find out my secret. I thought you told me this place was the secret. This isn't a real secret. You said so yourself. She giggled playfully. So do you want to know? I won't ask you again. Yes, of course. Thank you, Abe. I knew you'd be willing to listen. But I have to admit, you do look tired. Please come and visit me tomorrow evening. Then I'll reveal my secret to you. But you have to promise me you won't tell anybody else. Okay, sounds reasonable. I dropped May off at her farm on the way back to town. Don't forget, tomorrow evening. See you then.
Part 5. May. I do need to know more about her because she's fascinating. <laughs> Why do her eyes change colour? Why does she seem to have memories of like ancient times or something? Why does she have a brother that has disappeared? On Monday, when I returned home from school, I encountered an unlikely visitor waiting outside the house. An apprehensive uncertainty had taken over her usually so lofty attitude. It was clear that she'd been dreading this conversation. Rika, I thought we were through. Please don't make this any harder than necessary. I realise I may have been a little harsh yesterday, but try to understand this isn't about me or you. At times we must put aside our differences to protect those who are dear to us. In this case, May. May? Over the past month, her condition has been rapidly deteriorating. She's been displaying increasingly aberrant behaviour even out in public. People are beginning to talk. Behaviour? What kind of behaviour? May hasn't been herself recently. Last Saturday she was nearly hit by a tractor as she fled from some kind of unseen hallucination. She's always been an imaginative girl, but this is giving way to delusion. And do you know what I think? Not much of Rika's trepidation remained. I think it's the excitement. The exploits among the grave mounds, the trips to the beach, it's all too much for her. And at times I feel like you don't really care. That she's just another trophy to you. But you can't treat May like the other girls. She's too fragile. But she... Oh, I wish I'd put my foot down sooner. Rika's tone softened. I apologise. It's not your fault, Abe. I'm just... Just... I can't... I can't get her off me. They're just... The, the women love me, I just can't deal with it, you know? <laughs> Why does she act like that? Like... Oh, you know, we can't be friends with May. Obviously, we're trying to get her in bed or something. As long as May moves freely in this world, she'll meet people who will influence her. She's 19 now, a legal adult. There's not much we can do to protect her. In a sense, your interaction with her has served as a trial to see how she'd fare under new social relationships. Relationships we cannot protect her from. The thing is, May's mental issues, they stem from deeper psychological trauma. At times, she has difficulty distinguishing what is and isn't real. The reason she never fared well in school, she would be out causing commotion all day, chasing her imagined fancies. Isn't she receiving therapy? She is, and it's made... She's made great progress, but now that she's outgrown the program's instituted for children with psychiatric needs, she runs the risk of falling into a dark hole. The adult world preys on fragile minds. We need to protect and prepare May as well as we can, though I'm not sure if we can offer her the right help. She sighed. Oh, I apologise for the moaning. There's been a lot on my mind lately, with the indoor sports exhibition coming up next Friday. I have no business meddling in other people's affairs, and I won't obstruct you any longer. But please promise me you'll keep an eye on her. If you witness more unusual behaviour, you must inform me in a timely manner. May is a highly vulnerable young woman. If her episodes become any worse, she'll be in acute danger. Okay. Later that afternoon, I went to check up on Ina. I found her in her room, wholly intrepid. And as she still seemed unwilling to discuss our investigation any further, I decided to ask her what she knew about May. She stirred. May? You mean the slow-minded girl? She cast me a bemused glance. Everyone down here has a story about her. I let her corner me once when I was heading back home from school. I must have been in eighth grade. She started spouting a whole story about a family of rock rabbits who were all friends with her. It took me a while to tear myself loose, without being mean, you know. You could say she has a vivid imagination. I believe she's mostly harmless, though. And the town loves her. Each year on the 1st of May, they crown her May Queen and parade her through the streets on a decorated wagon, and then the villagers dance around the Maypole, while May oversees the spectacle from her throne. The church really abhors this tradition, you'll probably understand why. But aside from that, she'll mainly, she mainly just loiters around town. You get used to her, after a while. A wrinkle appeared on her forehead. Why do you ask? I can confirm she's single if that's what you're after. I've been talking to her lately. Ina smirked. If you show even the least bit of interest, she'll never let you go. I've noticed. Sounds like she's found a willing victim. May seems very interested in the geological features of the area. Sure, old stones, right? They're an obsession of hers. She has one or two things she really fixates on, and rocks are always one of them. If I ever get my newspaper back, we could ask her to write a weekly geology report. I don't think writing's really a strong point. And she can't read. But speaking of geology... May has stated a few times now that Abbott never was a real island. 
but it used to be connected to the mainland somehow. I guess like a peninsula. Can you make any sense of that? Ina thought long and hard. Not really. I told you she has a lively imagination. If that's what it is. Even though May's farm was just a short distance away, a sticky heat lingered in the evening air that made it unple an unpleasant journey. I arrived to find her standing outside. It was clear that she'd been waiting for me. I'm so glad you made it. A concerned look formed in her eyes as she inspected my worn out appearance. I'm sorry for acting so childish yesterday, but I really am glad you came. It's still early. Do you want me to show you around the farm? It's nothing special, you know. My parents run it by themselves, and I help them as much as possible. That's the cow shed over there. She gestured toward the large concrete barn that stood adjacent to the house. It appeared to have been erected during simpler times. We deliver milk to the village store, and we make our own cheese. She took me down to a small down a small country trail into a clearance between the trees, where an old hen house stood. This is where we normally keep the chickens. Sadly, they've all been transferred to a hospital for the time being, due to the, the recent avid flu outbreak. I'll introduce you to them when they're back safely in their coop. I was impressed by the level of responsibility May displayed, now that she was in a familiar environment. You seem to really know your way around this place. I do. My parents are very old, you see. They know their way around the farm, but they haven't really kept up with the times. She smiled. I try to help as much as possible, but it's hard. I don't know for how long we'll be able to stay in business. I followed her up to her room. This is my room. She cast me an apologetic smile. Not really a place fit for a queen. It feels more like a prison at times. A lonely dungeon tower where I suffer the same torture every night. She looked me straight in the eyes. Have you ever had the same dream? Over and over again? What do you mean? Have you? A dream that repeats itself night after night to the point you wake up screaming. At first it was hazy like a fog. But every time the dream returned it became clearer and clearer. To the point where I could smell the smoke of the fire, feel the warm stone beneath my feet, hear the lapping of waves and the distant yell of the night watchman. As though I were really there. I can even hear the tortured breath of the man, standing before me, wounded and weary. May had closed her eyes, recounting the dream frame by frame from memory in a grave, monotonous voice that had lost all of its prior playfulness. Tonight marks 13 years since Sigurd was taken away. I'm still unwed, though likely not for much longer, and I go up to the dolmen every night by myself to pray to the Allmother for Sigurd's return. But this time I'm not alone. A man has appeared out of the shadows, heavily weakened, spear in hand. He says he's looking for shelter, that he was sent away by the night watch, but that he saw a light burning nearby. And now he's asking for solace and a place to rest his head. May stared at me intently, as though pleading me to make sense of her words. But all I could do was stare back in silence. Although I distrust the man, I bandage and feed him. His naked body appears valiant underneath his wounds, and his eyes radiate a transparent blue. And as he rests, I inquire further into his past. He tells me the enemies hunt him, that he, they have taken all but his spear. The fire has died down and it's slowly replaced by a faint morning light. I ask him his name, but he laughs at the question. He tells me woe is him that I can refer to him this way. And the way he laughs, that boyish giggle, not at all woeful, reminds me of a time long, long ago when we played by the sea. Suddenly I hear a crack as a spontaneous fracture appeared in one of May's pop plant pots. But before I could stand up to inspect the damage, May had already resumed speaking, her voice sounding more frantic than before. We're shaken by the sound of voices and clatter of steel coming from the village below. The enemy has appeared at the gate, laying war upon the homestead for harbouring a fugitive. I can tell he's in anguish. I must leave soon, he says. My pursuers will burn down the village if they find out who you're hiding. But I beg him to stay, to at least tell me his name. Please tell me, I cry. I need to know. May let out a bitter sigh. This is where the dream ends. Look, she's got a heat pump in her room. That's pretty nice. Sorry. 
The moment when the world becomes intrusive and the morning sun awakens me. Do you understand my torture now? I'm dreaming the same dream again and again. Never knowing. Her eyes flickered. Saturday night I tapped car taped cardboard all over the window so no light or sound could penetrate my room. I know now how the dream goes on. Amidst the sound of spreading violence, I asked him once more his name. Although I knew the answer inside my heart, and he as he held me, he smiled, his eyes radiating in childlike brilliance. Do you not recognize me? Those eyes that I have cherished? Do you not recognize me? During those sun-filled youthful days? Now that I've returned? My sister? May grasped my arm. Is it you? Is it really you? Sigurd? My little brother? For who I've waited these countless years? She was staring at me, though, though I were the apparition from her dream, begging me with pale eyes. Sigurd, it really is you. I knew all along. Please do not leave without me. I'll follow you to the edge of the night. She embraced me with an iron grip, not letting go until she was fast asleep. Is that the secret? Her dream? I guess so. It was nearing the end of the year. The school was alive with the carefree bustle of holiday preparations and communal events. But my own mind was occupied with other matters like the case of the fair-haired girl that had recounted me her dreams the previous night and it was with these thoughts in mind that I was approached by Ulrika who was laying the last preparations for the indoor sports festival that would be held this coming Friday. Abe, could you please help me? The basketball team is so irresponsible they never have their preparations done in time. They consider themselves star athletes too good for manual labour. But who's ever heard of Abbotsford's achievements in basketball? She cast her eyes over the deserted sports hall, which looked no different from usual. If it were up to me, I'd discontinue the whole program. We should focus on our strong points. Like competitive swimming. We should focus on the things that I like. <laughs> I helped Rika with a few menial tasks, such as mopping the floor and positioning the bleachers. Then we adjusted the height of the nets to conform with national standards. It isn't much, but it'll have to do. I don't expect many people to show up anyway. She turned her attention away from the court. Are you coming to cheer for me this coming Friday? We're holding a demonstration tournament at the Olympic pool. I'd like it if you took my picture while I'm standing on the podium. You seem pretty confident of victory. Oh, I apologize for sounding so self-absorbed. It's just that it's important to create memories, especially when it comes to matters as transient as sports achievements. I promised Alika I'd be there. And before we said goodbye, I decided I wanted to share some of last night's events with her. And she seemed like the only one who was aware of May's disposition. I saw May again last night. An expression of both condemnation and curiosity flashed over her face. There, there. How was she? I hesitated. She appeared anxious. She's been having recurring nightmares. All centering on her little brother. Instantly, Rika took me by the hand, leading me to the adjacent locker rooms where we could speak in private. Her little brother? Her long lost little brother, right? Yes, she sighed. I was afraid of that. You should know May doesn't have a little brother. I nodded. How should I put this? It's important to keep in mind that not everyone has been as fortunate in life as you and I. The Lord's ways are mysterious as the pathways of the wind. Poor girl. We've all been condemned to suffer on this world, but for some the suffering has made so much more unbearable. She cleared her throat to keep her voice from breaking. It all happened about one year before I was born. On Sunday morning, the church warden gets up at 5am to prepare for Sunday service. It was spring, but the biting chill still lingered from the fresh morning air. As the warden unlocked the wooden doors that led to the main chapel, we heard a faint, exasperated wail. Many things have changed since the days of arcs and bulrushes. May had been left on the front porch in the early hours of the morning, wrapped in a blanket and a plastic shopping bag. There wasn't even a note. If she'd been found any later, she may not have made it. Lika cleared her throat. There exists a long-standing custom of leaving foundlings on the church steps. In the Middle Ages, there would even be a hatch near the entrance of the church where desperate mothers could safely abandon their unwanted child. But during the 20th century, as the standard of living improved, the hatch fell into disuse and was bolted shut. May was the first foundling to turn up in the abbot since the war. Poor girl. What a miserable start in life she had to be abandoned by the very people who were chosen to protect her. 
For the first few weeks, she was in and out of hospital receiving treatment against the effects of undernourishment and hypothermia. Then she stayed with my parents for a while. But little May made an impressive recovery and by the time she was about three months old, she was placed with the Walshings couple. They're good people, somewhat simple-minded, but I truly believe they have my May's best interests in mind. They were never able to have children of their own, you see. So you'll understand how overjoyed they were to welcome the baby in into their midst. But there was a rough road ahead. The first months of an infant's life make up the most crucial part of its formative years. May hadn't received the undivided motherly love that is so essential for the development of a person's cognitive abilities. As a child, May would always lag behind. She worked so hard, but still. When I was three and she was four, May was already like a little sister to me. She was the kindest child I ever knew, with such an active imagination, but her speech remained baby-like. She never figured out the alphabet or how to count. And it wasn't like she didn't try, it was just that it was all so hard for her. So hard. Like something was in the way inside her mind. Something so brilliant, so beautiful that it drowned out her understanding of the world around her. At times it was as though we lived in different worlds. May entered elementary school one year late, so we were in the same class. But even there she struggled. The staff, the children, they didn't understand May. All the teachers saw was her weird behaviour and the developmental milestones she kept missing. And the children took advantage of her kind-hearted nature by bullying her. And though I tried to protect her, I was only small. She simply couldn't go on this way. At the start of our second year, they chose to put her into a separate program. All social services in the town are coordinated by the church, including special education. Uh, we couldn't do much, but at least we could protect her. Protect her innocent, kind-spirited nature. I would have hated to see her go through the regular school system. The savagery. Vika clenched her fist tightly around a strand of her ink-black hair. May has been with us for 19 years now. The church's protection is coming to an end. She's not a child anymore. We need to find a place for her where she can learn real-world skills in a sheltered environment. Do you have a place in one? Vika swallowed. We do. A boarding school just over the border in Germany. I was seized by a paralyzing terror. They're fully equipped to deal with May's mental challenges. You're sending her away? It's not... But she loves it here. I know, Abe. It's just that we can't offer her the care she truly needs. The recent episodes you speak of, they've only been growing stronger. After a while, May may not be able to distinguish her fantasies from reality. Don't you see? There's something so large, so splendid inside of her, as though she isn't truly of this earth. But with a mind as beautiful and unique as hers, there's always lurks an imminent danger. If the fragments of her mind aren't accurately tempered, she could lose her connection to this world, and then she may fall victim to herself. I sunk down defeated. Are you sure it's a good place? The very best. Highland Stult. Ulsen Kirchen is what it's called. Apologies for murdering that. My father maintains a professional relation with their chaplain. I promise we'll go visit her every month. During the moment I spent with her, May always seemed so bright and easygoing. Though she acted childlike at times and displayed a stupefying fascination with minerals, I realised I had no idea of the deeper lying issues that surrounded the young woman. And though Rika's plan of deporting May to a faceless facility filled me with an incumbent dread, I had to admit the church had spent an exhaustible effort toward May's well-being. An effort that was entirely unthinkable to me, and this realisation made the situation so equivocal that I was unable to think of anything more to say. I know it's a hard choice, Abe, even for me, but we need to do what's best for May. I'm absolutely positive this is what's best for her. Over the next days, I want you to spend as much time with her as you can, to make her time here worthwhile. But please don't tell her anything about our plans. If she catches wind of her upcoming relocation, before being in the right care, it may trigger an intense episode of delirium. She could harm herself, or others. Well, that seems like the perfect time to wrap it up, doesn't it? So let's wrap it up right now. Um, and we'll kick off from here in the next one. Very interesting. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Thanks again out with me and I'll see you in the next one.